Well, what's up, Porch? How are we doing tonight? Hey, it's, uh, it's good to see you. If this is your first time ever with us at the Porch, anyone here for the first time ever just checking it out? Awesome. It's great. Glad you made it. Hey, let me just introduce myself. My name is Timothy Atik, and I'm one of the teaching pastors here uh, on Tuesday nights as well as on Sunday mornings at Watermark, and I'm so glad you made it. Thanks for trusting us with your Tuesday evening. I know there's a lot of places that you could be tonight, so we're grateful that you are spending tonight with us. I wanna say hello to all the Porch Live locations that are watching right now. I am looking at you, Porch Live Greater Lafayette, Porch Live Fort Worth, and uh, Porch Live Indy, hello. I hope that you guys are doing great. Thanks for uh, streaming along with us uh, tonight. If If you don't know what we are about here at The Porch, we exist to call any and every young adult to see Jesus and to surrender fully to life with him. And so we hope that uh, Jesus comes into clear view for you uh, this evening. I'm gonna start by sharing something with you that you're gonna be like, why is he telling us this? And I get it, but I'm gonna share it anyway. Last night, My wife and I, we were getting in the car to go to a friend's house to watch uh, the Rangers do something amazing to now be heading to the World Series, which is amazing. Uh, But as we were getting into the car, my wife's cell phone uh, battery was almost dead, like it was showing red on her screen. And so as we're getting into the car, she was like, hey, do you have a plug in your car? And then at the same time, she answered her own question. I didn't need to answer it for her. She said, oh, wait, you don't even have plugs that work in your car. So here's the story behind that. At some point along the journey of me having my really sweet 2015 Hyundai Sonata, at some point all of the fuses to each of the plugs in the car have gone out. So I have two like circle, what we used to call cigarette lighters. I've got two of those in the front and both of those don't work. And then I have a USB plug and that doesn't work. And then there's a cigarette lighter in the back and that doesn't work either. And it's been like that now for well over a year. And, uh, And I just live with it. Like my cell phone is at the point where somehow Apple magically knows when I'm up for an upgrade and then the battery just tanks all of a sudden, which is kind of crazy. But it's at that point uh, to where my phone really doesn't stay charged all day long. And so now when I'm going on a road trip, I have to think I don't have a way of charging my phone in the car. So sometimes I'll bring along like that little cell phone charger, or I'll have to plug it into my computer in the car. And I have just decided that is how I'm gonna operate. And you're like, why are you telling us this? This is not even that interesting. Like this kind of sounds dumb and it kind of sounds crazy. As I'm telling it, I feel a little crazy in sharing it because if you hear that, you might hear that and just think to yourself, that's totally fixable. Like you literally, all you need to do on the way home tonight is go to Walmart for five minutes, buy a new fuse, go plug it into the car and you will have power again for your cell phone. And yet for over a year now, I have been figuring out workarounds for something that is easily fixable and there is a solution. And I tell you that because I wonder if that is our story when it comes to lingering sin in our lives. And you might hear that and be like, look, the sin in my life, the stuff that I'm struggling with, I've tried to fix it. I've tried to get rid of it. So for you to equate my sin struggles to your little 2015 Hyundai Sonata problems, those two things should never be mentioned in the same sentence. But what I'm asking you to do is I'm asking you to see your sin issues from God's perspective. Because when you see things through God's lens, just imagine what God thinks. When he looks at your sin, knowing that 
Christ already conquered Satan's sin and death on the cross. I wonder if God is looking at us and our sin struggles in the stuff that we allow to linger in our lives. And I wonder if he's like, there's a solution and it's totally fixable. It is totally fixable. And yet many of us go through life just with workarounds. It's just like, well, you know what? This is just the way it is. And this is, this is just, I guess, who I am and how it's always going to be. And so I'm just going to kind of manage life and, and just deal with it. And tonight we're going to continue in our series through the Gospel of John. The, the Gospel of John exists for us to see Jesus clearly. That is why we, we've titled this series Glory. Glory, the idea of glory is just the infinite goodness of God being displayed in our lives. We want to behold the glory of Jesus Christ. That's why each week we've just been looking at one aspect of Jesus. Tonight, John chapter 5 is going to reveal to us Jesus the healer. Because there is a solution to whatever sin is beating you up right now. There is a solution and it is fixable. But in order for you to take ground and experience joy in life and freedom, you will have to become acquainted with Jesus Christ as healer. And so here's my hope tonight. My hope is that you're going to walk out of here um, with a new sense in an urgency in your heart. Like how crazy would it be for me to go another day just with a workaround? Because there is a solution and it is fixable. So if you have a Bible, turn with me tonight to John chapter 5. John chapter 5 is where we're going to be. You guys out there tonight, are y'all with me? I just need to make sure. I just want to make sure that we're good, all right? I know it's raining, and I'm so proud of you for fighting the rain. I was driving here, and I was like, these people are committed. Like, the fact that you made it, well done. Well done. All right. Tonight, what we need to do as we walk through this text is, is I'm going to invite you to answer four questions when it comes to the sin in your life. So here they are. I'll go ahead and give them to you so that you will see them in the passage as we walk through. The first question is this, what needs to be healed? Like what's broken in your life right now? What isn't working as it should? What needs to be healed? The second question is this, do you want to be healed? The third question is, how do you think you will be healed? And then the fourth question is, what's the goal of being healed? Okay? So let's start with the first one. The first question is, what needs to be healed? Look at what the text says. John chapter 5, verses 1 through 3. It says this, after this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now, there is in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool in Aramaic called Bethesda which has five roofed colonnades. In these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. So that's the, that's the scene. Jesus goes to Jerusalem and commentators kind of debate on what this place is. But what we do know is that Jesus shows up to this place. There is a pool there. Um, the people that are gathering there are people who are in need of healing. We know that because, as we're going to find out later, there's a superstition around the waters that are there, and people believe that those waters can heal them. But the text tells us, John the author tells us, that this is a gathering place for invalids. That's a general term uh, that refers to people uh, who are sick, weak, or powerless. And And John kind of gives us more insight into who is in attendance. He says that there's blind people, there's lame people, and there's paralyzed people. So the picture that we need to get is that this is a gathering of people who need healing because something in their lives isn't working right. Their eyes aren't working as they should. Their bodies are not working as they should. So they are in need of healing. 
And honestly, that's why they're there. They are there because they believe that the pool can heal them. Now, I just wanna ask you this. So all eyes on me right now. As I was preparing for tonight, part of me just wondered, I wonder if this room right now and everyone watching online, like wherever you are, I just wonder if this place isn't very different than the pool of Bethesda. What if this is a gathering of a bunch of people who are in need of healing? Like there is something in each of our lives that isn't working as it should. And so I just wanna ask you to take inventory of your own life. What in your life needs to be healed? What isn't working as it should? What in your life is broken? And you might hear that word broken and think nothing. Like this is the problem with Christianity is that you wanna put problems where there are no problems. I'm not a broken person. I just wanna invite you to evaluate. Like if the majority of your decisions every day, whether small or big, are driven by whether or not someone else will notice you, approve of you, or like you in real life or on social media, can't we agree that something needs healing? Like there's something broken about that. Your life is just a perpetual audition. It's like you're living in the voice where you're just wondering who it is that's gonna say, yeah, yeah, you, I choose you. That there's something that isn't right about that. Or what about this? If you regularly lie, exaggerate, or tell half-truths about who you are, what you have, or what you've done to make yourself look better than you really are, can't we agree that something might need healing there? Or if you only see the negative in yourself, you look in the mirror and you only see your flaws, you look at your personality and you only see what's undesirable, you look at your life and only see where you're failing, can't we agree something needs healing there? If it doesn't take much for you to get angry, like sometimes you just wake up angry, like nothing even prompted it, you just wake up and you are already at that point. And when you're angry, you're explosive or you're hurtful in the way that you think or talk or act. And you're a little out of control. Can't we agree that something might not be working as it should? Something might need healing. Or if you manipulate and use guys or girls and you're numb to the fact that your actions and words cause hurt and pain in their lives, can't we agree there's something broken about that? Or if you find yourself consistently doing things that you don't want to do despite your best efforts, whether it's looking at porn or having too much to drink or using drugs or manipulating your diet in an unhealthy way or cutting yourself, can't we agree that something needs healing? You're like, what's the point, dude? Like, just get to the point. Like, I promise I didn't bring you here tonight to beat you over the head. My goal in talking about very specific things is is it is good for us to start by answering the question, what in your life needs to be healed? Because there's a solution. It is fixable. There is more life to be experienced. Over the years, God has had to reveal to me different big things in my life that are in need of healing, whether it's a, whether it's a battle with lust or, or bitterness or resentment residing in my heart or just an unhealthy need for people's approval. Those are all things that have been broken in my life and have needed healing and continued healing. So that's the scene. Okay, John paints a picture of this gathering place for a bunch of people who are in need of healing. Now, what John is gonna do is he, and what Jesus is gonna do is he is going to zero in on one person in particular. Look at verse five. It says one man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. So now the story goes from general to specific. And out of all the people that are gathering around the pool, Jesus chooses one guy. And the text is very clear. He has been an invalid for for 38 years. He has not been able to walk for 38 years. Now, here's what I want you to see. This is a story that is meant to drive us toward knowing Jesus as healer. 
So the reason that John mentions that he's been an invalid for 38 years is because he wants us to feel the weight of this man's life and he wants us to come to the conclusion that this guy has been in need of healing for 38 years. And I tell you that just because if you want to gain some perspective and if you want to feel a little bit crazy, just take a minute and think about how long something in your life has needed healing. Like I, I battled pornography from the summer before my freshman year in high school until the summer before my senior year in college. I, I lived in the grips of pornography for seven years. That's how long I was in need of healing from a deep battle with pornography. I shared this at church on Sunday, but uh, there was a time years ago when I was actually an intern here at Watermark Community Church. This was back in 2005. Some of y'all are like, I was four then. Okay, that's great. <laughs> but back in 2005, I was interning here and I had to step off of staff because of some really compromising decisions that I had made. And, uh, but I left bitter. There was a few people on the church staff that I left feeling hurt by. And what happened was that hurt transformed into bitterness. And that bitterness began to grow inside of my soul like a weed. And it overtook everything unhealthy. It, it overtook everything healthy in me. And so this is what it looked like. Like there was a time, I want you to think about this. I'm standing on the stage of Waterbrook now. There was a time when, when I would come to Dallas, I couldn't stand to drive past Watermark. Like to be on 635 and to see Watermark, I literally felt nauseous. There was a time when if I heard certain names of people that worked at Watermark, I would want ill for them. Like if something negative was said about them, I felt some gratification with it. Like that was a reality. And I became the drama friend. Like anytime I would be with some of my closest friends, do you know what they were hearing about? They were hearing about my bitterness towards Watermark. Do you know how long that bitterness raged in my life? Four years. Four years that bitterness took over my soul like a weed. And then God finally in his kindness intervened and he has done a miraculous work to not only restore those relationships to a point now where those are friends, but he's brought me back to Watermark. But healing had to take place. But I look back and I feel a little crazy when I look back on that season to think four years I allowed myself to be robbed of life. For four years, I needed healing and resisted it. With pornography, for seven years, I missed out on life. I lived with something broken. Imagine if my opening illustration with the outlets, I was like, yeah, it's been like that for seven years. Wouldn't you be like, dude, just get a new car. Just buy a new car, be done with it, it's time. You'd be like, this is so crazy. I'll go buy the fuses for you. Just point me to your car. I'll put them in it. It'll take me five minutes and we'll be done with it. But when I, I just want to invite you, just think how long has something been broken? How long have you been missing out on life? How long have you been looking at porn? How long have you been auditioning for people's approval? How long have you been cutting yourself or starving yourself? That's how long you've been missing out on wholeness. That's how long you've needed healing. Now, here's the thing. When we allow something to remain broken in our lives, when there is a solution and it is fixable, but we, when we allow it to move in and make itself at home, do you know what we begin believing? We begin believing that this is just the way it is and this is just who we are. I'm just an angry person. I'm just a lustful person. I'm just an insecure person. This is just who I am, and that is a lie from the pit of hell because you are a child of God, and what God says about you is way more significant than what our enemy, the devil, who is a liar, has to say to you about you. 
are you guys out there? I just need to make sure. I, I'm sorry I keep checking. I'm just, I'm making sure. Okay. So then here's what's going to happen. Is Jesus is going to interrupt this man's life with a question. And it's going to be the second question I want to invite you to answer. These are just Jesus' words. Look at what Jesus says in verse 6. It says this, when Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, do you want to be healed? That's the second question. Do you want to be healed? Can, <laughs> can you imagine being the guy who hasn't walked in 38 years and you've been laying by this pool day after day and this guy just walks up and matter-of-factly asks you, hey man, do you want to be healed? What's he going to say? No. Like, no, man, I'm good. But that blind guy, I bet he would love it. But I'm good. No. But Jesus walks up in just a moment. He assumes that the impossible is possible. And if you're talking to a guy who hasn't walked in 38 years and you ask him, do you want to be healed? I would imagine that the answer is always yes. But when you switch into the spiritual realm and you're talking about sin, it becomes a much more thoughtful question that requires a thoughtful answer. Because something that you need to evaluate is when it comes to what needs healing in your life, you really need to evaluate, do you want to be healed? Like, do you actually want to be healed? Because... If your answer is yes, what you have to understand is if Jesus invades your life and goes to work on the thing that is broken in your life, two things are probably going to happen. Number one, Jesus will have to uproot that sin from your life, and sin can be really enjoyable. The second thing that you need to know is Jesus might ask you to make tough decisions in order to be done with that sin. So let's just take those two issues. One is that Jesus is going to step in and do some uprooting in your life. So I'll, I'll explain it this way. And this is not a dating talk. And I'm not, even, I'm not even really talking about relationships right now. Although I'm going to use a relationship illustration to kind of take you where I want you to go. I've counseled a lot of people over the years who have been in unhealthy dating relationships. And, and I can sit down with a guy or a girl and they can start unpacking their relationship. And as they're talking, it's, it's so incredibly clear that their relationship is so packed full of drama and unhealth and, and impurity and insecurity and someone's using the other and, and one person is cheating on them. And it's just so unhealthy. And so do you know what my encouragement is? I think it's time to get out of the relationship. Like it is time to let this thing go. Why? Because this relationship is stealing from you. And yet there's been different times where I've, I've encouraged them, I think it's time to get out of the relationship and they haven't taken the advice. Do you wanna know why? Here's the exact words. I just can't imagine my life without him in it. I just can't imagine my life without her in it. Do you know what's happening? Is that they are afraid to let go of something that might be stealing from them, and yet it's still giving them something. Maybe it's giving them companionship. Maybe it's, maybe it's giving them plans on the weekend. Maybe it's giving them the hope of getting married instead of still being single, and so they're scared to let it go. It's possible that, that this might be similar to your relationship with sin. Like you might, if you were honest, you might say, I just can't imagine my life without alcohol in it. Like what if people don't like the sober me? Like I just can't imagine my life without pornography in it. Like where am I going to get a release from? I can't imagine my life without overspending because how boring will my life become if I can't eat out when I want to eat out and, and go on the trip when I want to go on the trip and, and wear what I want to wear? Like what? I don't know that I can imagine my life without this in it. And so it's just 
it's good to realize that you might not be ready to be healed yet because you still think your sin is giving you something that you can't live without. But then the second thing that might happen is Jesus might ask you to make tough decisions in order for him to accomplish his healing in your life. So I told y'all that I wrestled with pornography for, for seven years. And do you know what finally happened as I reached a point in my life where I made the decision, I'm willing to do whatever it takes to be done with pornography. I'll do whatever it takes. And so I literally, I put myself in a place where there wasn't a 1% chance of me looking at porn. Like I just didn't have access to it. And that's what I needed in my life. Like I had to put myself in a position where like I, I didn't care how inconvenient it would be. Like if I had to go only to the public library to use the computers there to get on the internet, like it was worth it. That's the place that I got to. And over the years, people have heard my story with porn and They've been like, hey, can we get coffee and let's sit down and talk about it. And so I will sit with people and I'm like, hey, let me just ask you, are you at a place where you're kind of willing to do whatever it takes to be done with porn? Like for Jesus to to go to work and to uproot it from your life. And I begin to talk to them about some of the decisions that I had to make, which were tough decisions. And as I'm explaining it, they drop eye contact with me. They start looking around and they're like, oh, shoot, like there's... There's not like just a lever I can pull where it's like the porn lever is now turned off. Like it's no longer a temptation. I can just carry my phone around and it's not going to be a problem. And so they they just totally disengage from the conversation. Why? Because they thought I was going to just hand them freedom, like a freedom pill where you just pop it and it's like, okay, it worked. Well, that's over. And yet, and so what it shows me is like, okay, you're not, you're not ready to be free yet. And please don't hear me talking about like it's all like effort. No, I'm just saying that Jesus gives us wisdom. And one of the ways that Jesus moves and works in our lives is he, he calls us away from the habits and the rhythms that naturally pull us back toward our sin. And so you might hear all of that and you might hear Jesus' question now in a different light. If he's looking at you saying, do you want to be healed? Some of you might be honest and say, at this point, not really. And others of you are like, yes, I want to be healed because I see my sin clearly, like the thing that I thought was giving me life is stealing from me. Like it's worth it, whatever, whatever Jesus asks me to do, whatever is necessary, I will do it. The third question that I wanna invite you to ask from this passage is this, how do you think you'll be healed? Like how do you think it'll be accomplished? Look at how the man responds in verse seven. Says the sick man, now he's responding to Jesus' question, Do you want to be healed? It says this in verse 7 The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I'm going, another steps down before me. So do you see his response? He's like, Look, man, I, I do want to be healed, but the problem is I don't have anyone to help put me into the waters when the waters are stirred. So Here's what you need to understand. There was this superstition at this point in time that periodically the waters would get stirred by some supernatural force and the first person to get in the waters when they were supernaturally stirred would be healed. Now, this guy's response is both wrong and right at the same time. What makes this guy's response wrong is that he believes that something else will bring healing to his life besides Jesus. He believes that the thing that will heal him is the pool that is supernaturally stirred periodically. And let me just tell you, when it comes to dealing with sin in your life, Jesus is the only one who's ever gone to war with sin and conquered it. 
And so at the root of whatever your struggle is, there's, there's sin there. There's a lie that is being believed there. And Jesus Christ left heaven, came to earth, went to the cross, and on that cross, listen to the words of 1 John 3, 8. It's not gonna be on the screen, but, but it says that the Son of God appeared to destroy the works of the devil. That's why he came. He came to destroy the works of the devil. He is the only one who's done that and succeeded. So I tell you that just to say, look, if your greatest hope for finding healing and freedom from your sin, it's found in Jesus. It is found in Jesus. The thing that was right about this guy's response is that he, is he said, I don't have anyone to help me into the waters. He believed that it would require the help of others in order for him to experience healing. And I think that there's a lot of truth to this because a lot of times God will use his people to bring healing into the lives of his people. And so that's why James tells us in James 5.16, he says, therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another. Why? That you may be healed. God rarely will heal someone in isolation. Why? Because he loves you. And that's why the Bible starts out in the second chapter of the whole thing. It says, it is not good for man to be alone. Why? Because God values community. Like when you become a Christian, one of the be most beautiful benefits of, of knowing Jesus Christ is not just that it's now, it's just me and Jesus. Like, we're just gonna do our thing. I just need him and, and he just wants me. No, he invites you into the family of God to where now you have brothers and sisters in the faith. I don't even know some of your names and yet you're my brothers in Christ. You're my sisters in Christ. We're in the same family. We can help one another out. We can encourage one another to look like children of God to walk in freedom from sin. God uses his people to bring healing into the lives of his people. So I tell you that just to say, maybe your first step is just allowing yourself to be known and loved, like to call a friend tonight and to just say, man, I just need to let you know this thing is broken in my life and I need help. Or maybe you're gonna make a decision to show up to regeneration next Monday night. Regeneration is our is our recovery program for anyone who is wanting to break free from sin in their lives. Look at how Jesus responds to this guy, verse eight. This is kind of the climax of the story. Jesus said to him, get up. Can you imagine that? I just want you, like anytime you read the Bible, anytime you read his story, especially in the gospels, Try and put yourself there. Try and see what, you're, what we're reading. Try and visualize it. Try and hear it. Try and smell it. Like, see it in color. So you got a guy who hasn't walked in 38 years, and Jesus looks at him and he's like, hey man, get up. Like, that's a big deal. That's a moment of faith where you either are like, no, I'm, we're not gonna do that. But just imagine, he says, get up, take up your bed and walk. And at once, the text is very clear, at, at once, not, not over a long period of time, not progressively, at once, the man was healed and he took up his bed and walked. Can you imagine just seeing how his legs respond to feeling something for the first time in 38 years. Like, I don't know what he did when he hopped up. If he kind of, I, I just would have loved to be there. Like, what was, his, what was his first movement? But who brought the healing? It was Jesus Christ. And when Jesus' life and this man's life collided, it changed everything. This guy felt feeling in his legs for the first time. This guy moved in certain ways that he had never moved before. This guy saw things from a perspective that he had never seen from. He changed everything. Now this guy has no reason to be lying by the pool of Bethesda 
So he just changed this guy's entire routine, all of his rhythms. His life was completely changed. And yet we're talking about Jesus healing our souls. And so I just want to stand up here before you and say, it really works. Jesus is healer. I know the healing power of Jesus Christ over pornography. I stand up here tonight and testify that he ransomed me from it. He broke me free from it. Like I know the... I know, that, I know the healing power of Jesus Christ over bitterness. The fact that I even walked into this building tonight is the grace of God in my life that he stripped out the bitterness of my soul. And I call those people friends. I have watched the healing power of Jesus Christ in so many different people's lives. I remember a, a guy coming up to me and showing me the scars on his arms from cutting himself. And he, and he talked about he has experienced the healing power of Jesus Christ over his life from the self-hate that he was living in. I've seen the healing power of Jesus over alcohol and drugs. I've, I've witnessed it over and over again. If you want to know the answer to how do, will you be healed? Here's the answer, Jesus Christ, period. Healing is found in Jesus Christ. And that can be true for you. Don't look at me as like, well, of course you're a pastor. So like you're gonna have those stories of healing because there's like, you've got some like special connection to God. No, the, I'm, just, I'm just another child of God. I'm just another kid in the family. There is nothing more special about me than you. In fact, like I've still got my own things in my life that I still need healing from. And yet in those areas of my life, I can say, no, I, I, the reason that I'll seek healing in other areas of my life now is because I've known Jesus to be healing, healer in the past. And you can know him as healer too. The final question that I wanna invite you to answer is this, what's the goal of being healed? What's the goal of being healed? This story takes a really weird turn. And I'm gonna read a big chunk, but I want you to see it. it. It doesn't have the outcome that you would hope that it has in this guy's life. Because this guy gets up. He rolls up his mat and carries it home. Now watch this. The end of verse nine, it says, now that day was the Sabbath. So the Jews said to the man who had been healed, it's the Sabbath and it's not lawful for you to take up your bed. But he answered them, the man who healed me, that man said to me, take up your bed and walk. They asked him, who is the man who said to you, take up your bed and walk? Now the man who had been healed did not know who it was for Jesus had withdrawn as there was a crowd in the place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, see, you are well, sin no more that nothing worse may happen to you. Watch this, verse 15. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. And verse 16 goes on and says, and this was why the Jews were persecuting Jesus. Isn't that weird? This guy has been healed and they're like, who healed you? He's like, I don't know. That's kind of, Red flag number one. Like if a guy heals you, like common courtesy, hey man, what's your name? <laughs> Jesus? Jesus, thank you. I don't know if you know this, I haven't been able to walk in 38 years and now because of you, I can. So Jesus, thank you. That's all it takes. Learn a name. But you know what the second thing that's concerning is? Jews come to him, they're like, who was it? He's like, I don't know. And Jesus finds him. He's like, well, I'm Jesus. And he's like, good, now I have a name. And he goes back to the Jews. He's like, I got a name for you. It was Jesus. And that's what prompted them to start persecuting Jesus. How weird that this guy's life was radically changed by Jesus, and yet he didn't know Jesus or have a sense of any allegiance to Jesus. And I look at this and here's my conclusion. He wanted healing, but he didn't want the healer. He wanted healing, but he didn't want the healer. 
And so the question I'm asking is, what is the goal of being healed? Like, be honest with yourself. Is your goal simply so that you don't feel like a failure anymore? Is the goal so that you will just feel like you're crushing life more, like you're realizing that some of your habits are getting in the way of you really getting to where you want to be professionally? So you're like, you know what, I just need to clean some things up so that, so that I can crush life better. Is the goal so just that you can feel better, like you're in a better place to get married? What is it? What I want you to understand is that Jesus is not a means to an end. He is the end. So let me, let me just talk very personally, okay? Because I, if that's where you are, if you're like, oh man, this is okay. I feel convicted. Like I want the healing. I don't know about the healer. I just want the healing. So here's been my experience. I get it. I understand. Like the, the time that I worked at Watermark and had to step off staff, it was, it was due to sin in my own life. And, uh, and everything, I mean, I lost, I lost my job. I lost, I, I, everything kind of came crumbling down in my world. And so I got on a plane and I left the country and at first, do you know what I wanted? I just wanted God to do a lot of healing really quickly so that I would be in a good place to date again. I wanted to just be in a good place to where I could date and get married to someone, honestly. Like that, that's me just being honest, saying I wanted the healing more than the healer. But what happened when I left the country is every day I just began to give myself over to the Lord. Like all I, all I could do every day was just spend time, a lot of time, just listening to God through his word. And then I'd open up my journal every day. I'd just pour my heart out to the Lord in prayers. I would write to friends at home just telling them what God was doing in my life. And in the midst of wanting healing, you know what happened? Was I found the healer in a way that I never had before. And I came home more in love with Jesus than I had ever loved him. And I began to see Jesus more clearly than I had ever seen him in my life. And I realized that the goal in dealing with my sin, it wasn't the healing, it was the healer. It was just to be with Jesus more. It was to see Jesus more. Matthew 5, 8, Jesus says this, blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. That's why we want Jesus to uproot sin from our lives. That's why we want him to purify our hearts. Why? So that we'll see God. But here's the reality. Um, when you're not seeing God clearly, you fall into sin. And the reason that you choose sin over God is because you're not seeing God clearly. And what's happening is that you're hydrating yourself with salt water and, and it looks like the answer, but it's not the answer. But this shift has to come where you begin to take a step of faith, where you begin to believe just possibly that Jesus can satisfy you in a way that your sin can't, that he's actually better than your sin is. And that's a step of faith where you can't see Jesus that clearly but you take a step of faith where you just say, look, Jesus, I don't just want healing. I want the healer. I want to know you more because I believe that in you is life. You are the bread of life. You're the only one who can truly satisfy the deepest longings of my soul. So Jesus, would you come and would you satisfy me? And then I just want to end tonight by saying, if you're here tonight and you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, Here's what I want you to understand. The reason that things in your life are broken is because your relationship with God is broken. And the guy in the story, it, it shows us what makes Christianity and what makes Jesus so great. Like, did you think about the fact that Jesus just sought this one guy out? Like there's a lot of people who needed to be healed, but he came up to this one guy and it's possible that Jesus brought you here tonight because he is singling you out. He is coming after you because he wants to do a significant work in your 
life. But what's different between us and this guy is that we aren't just paralyzed by sin, we are dead in our sin. That's what the Bible says, that we are dead in our sin, which means a dead person is incapable of doing anything that would be pleasing to God. We can't make ourselves right with God. And yet his question to you tonight is, do you want to be healed? Like, do you want a real relationship with Jesus Christ where he can forgive all of your sins and make you right with your maker? See, this guy thought that something else could heal him. And you can take that posture too. You can say, well, you know, I'm just going to try harder. I'm going to do better. And you know what? I'll just find my own way and find my own spirituality. But let's just be clear. Only Jesus could heal that guy and only Jesus can heal your relationship with God. Your relationship with God is broken. That man's life was changed. But when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, where you come to a place where you just say, Jesus, I want you to be my savior. He doesn't just change your life. He makes your life new. And that's what's on the table for you tonight. Complete forgiveness, complete newness, a right relationship with God. So I'm just going to ask you to respond tonight. However you want to respond. If you don't know Jesus and you want to begin a relationship with Jesus, then talk to him tonight. Pray to him. Invite him into your life. If there's something broken in your life and you want to pray with someone, there's going to be people down front. We'll be down front. We'd love to talk to you. If we can counsel you, we'd love to do that. If we can pray for you, we want to do that. Maybe you just sit in your seat as we sing and you just say, God, I'm finally at a point. I want want to be healed. Maybe you text a friend and just say, man, I got to talk. Can we talk about what's going on? Or maybe you make a decision right now. You're going to come to Regen next Monday. But let's take a step. And and then I'm just going to say this. This is a little bit different, but some people here tonight, you read this story about Jesus physically healing this guy. And you're like, man, I wish Jesus would still heal physically today. If you'd like someone to pray over you for physical healing, I don't know what Jesus is doing in your life, but we'd love to pray for you as well. Let me close this in prayer. Lord Jesus, I pray that you would come and just have your way, do a work in our lives. I pray that our hearts would be soft towards you, God. Would you show us what in our lives is in need of healing, Lord? And I pray that we would just sense you asking us the question tonight, do you want to be healed? And I pray that the desire of our heart would be yes, Lord God. I pray that we would realize that healing is found in you, Lord Jesus. And I pray that the ultimate goal would be to get you, more of you, God. May we see you in a way that we've never seen you. We love you. We respond to you now. In Jesus' name, amen.